Okay, folks. Now we're going to talk about deforming rocks. Obviously an important process when we think about rocks on continents particularly and building continents and building mountains. As you can see here that Australia was built by the assembling of numerous different origin and in the mountain building uh, snippet I talk about what an origin or origenic or orogeny. These are all the same words from the Greek word for mountain, oros. So mountain building processes. So whenever you see squiggly rocks like this that have been incredibly deformed, think that these rocks have been deformed in such a manner that thickened the crust. That's part of making the continents. Up on the top here we have from the Devonport range, ranges in Northern Territory, remnants of a 1.7 billion year old mountain belt that formed far, far away from here, and it was part of the assembling of Australia. This is a famous zebra rock from Kangaroo Island, which is some um, amazingly folded quartzite and schist layers, so that there's layers of quartzite and then there's layers of more shaly stuff, and they contrast each other greatly. This is a beautiful place to go on holiday, even though it was burnt recently. I still recommend you go there. Fascinating stuff. But notice how these little layers, this is the original bedding. You see how it's been deformed into little synclines, anticlines, synclines, anticlines. So this has all been folded intensely. And that's what I'm talking about today. So the concept is when you take strata that are flat line and you be begin to compress them, and that's the main thing I'm talking about here, is you're squashing them. So from this side on the right and this side on the left, we're squashing them inward. And this makes folds. And we talked about in Prac, where you have a syncline attaches to an anticline, syncline, anticline. Series of fold rock. You do this with a piece of paper at home. That as you push the paper together, it will crumple up in this sort of fashion. And when we have something that's dipping down on both sides into the middle, like this diagram, I just lost my pointer. Let's see if I can find it back. Oh, lost my pointer. Let's try it here. Let's try it there. Oh, goodness. Hmm. Shit. Oh, there it is. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so when we have it dipping downward into the center, we call this a syncline. Syncline being a little, a little basin-like thing, only it's a linear feature, right? So it's not a round thing like a basin. And an anticline is just the opposite, where on each side the beds dip outward. So this is an anticline and this is a syncline. And you can draw a, a mirror plane through the middle of these, and that is the axis. In other words, everything on the right of this plane dips off that way, and everything on the left of this plane dips off that way. So this thing defines the syncline very nicely. Just like, I mean the anticline, just like in the syncline, this plane, everything dips up this way from it, and that way up from it. So it's the plane that defines the change in dip. And you can see here, these are flat line anticlines and synclines, but this, this line on here is horizontal. It doesn't have to be. Okay, so one of the other things we do besides faulting is, uh, folding is faulting. And this is a really nice drawing, because if we look down the bottom here, if we start to fold, first step, then we fold it more, it starts to flop over, then we fold it more, it starts to really flop over, and eventually it flops over, and then we get what we call thrust faulting, where we thrust this left side of the diagram up on top of the right side. So this is a thrust fault, and that means that this side, the top side, is moved up relative to it. So we have different names that we use for faulting, and what we call a normal fault is a fault where one side simply goes down relative to the other. So I'll, I've always liked to remember it as a normal fault is something where gravity could have done most of the work. This is typical of extension. You pull the rocks apart and one part falls down. This is very important when we rift continent. We see a lot of normal faults. 
right? And that normal fault could be in a lot of different geometries. Here's the same exact thing, but, it, but the angle to the bedding is different, right? There are also what we call strike-slip faults. So along the strike of the fault, it simply moves laterally. This is very much like the transform faults we talked about on the ocean floor, right? So there are a number of geometries here. This is a normal, and this up here is reverse, where this top block is moved up relative. So this is an example of compression. This is an example of extension, right? We can also have a situation where both are occurring, where it's moving along both ways, in that it's going up and over. So it has some of this transform, but it also has a bunch of this reverse faulting. So there's nothing that says it has to move in any simple way. But this sort of chunk of rock here is what we see in eastern Australia. When we rifted eastern Australia, we, we formed what they call Horst and Graben, where blocks of material move down relative to others. We also have that around Canberra. So many of the high points of Canberra are simply this material that's left up. And then it's, it's been eroded a bit to shape it, but the down flat areas are called horsts, where they drop down, the upper part's called the grub. Okay, so I mentioned that in a fold, the axis in the original one I showed you can be sitting flat, but this is one where the hinge, the line on the plane, you know, just like the dip we did with the bed, that on the axial plane, that if you draw a horizontal line and then you measure it down to the axis, in other words, the line that separates one side from the other, that is the plunge of the fold. And if a fold plunges, it changes the shape of the outcrop. So here's a plunging syncline on the right. There's the hinge plunging off to the right here. Here's a plunging anticline. The hinge is plunging off to the right there. Okay, so when you do that, you have a syncline, anticline, syncline, anticline. Only you've tilted it. If you rode it off flat, you end up with these beautiful patterns of the beds going around like this. And all it means is that you can see that, for instance, this anticline, if we have dipping off this way and dipping off this way, only the axis is dipping down so that it gets exposed at different areas. So this is a more typical pattern of a plunging series of folds. And of course it's plunging off in that direction to the north. Then this was weathered off flat and horizontal material was put on top of it and you already know that that defines an unconformity. <clears throat> okay, so we can have um, horizontal folds, we can have plunging folds, but we can also have folds that are things like a dome where it's doubly plunging and everything, everything's coming up to a top and then you level it off and you get this neat little ring shape. So this is called a dome and this is called a basin. So what this is, is a fold that's been folded. So we had a fold, so it was like a nice incline here, and then we squashed it this way, and it made this beautiful basket. The idea here is we have the oldest formation on these on the outside, and in a dome we have the youngest formation on the outside. So that's a very typical thing. And if you look at this picture, this is something that we see around the world where we have a doubly folded syncline that is now in a basin. And there are lots of these. The Flinders Range is full of them. Well, Pina Pound is a place I recommend you go to. It's a big pound because they used to let sheep in there to graze and they didn't have to put fences up because the units took care of it. <clears throat> so now let's look at folding for a bit. If you look at outcrops anywhere in the world, and you can see many of these are on camera. In fact, you can go to Parliament House and see beautifully folded outcrops there. These are just some that I took off the web because I thought they were cool. And you can see here the bedding is coming around and going like this. So we have a syncline, anticline. And certainly there's a syncline there, right? So this syncline went up like that, and it would have come around like this. So the nice thing is you know that when you have syncline coming up, you would have had an anticline over here. When you have this anticline, then you know there's going to be a syncline, and anticline, etc. So that you can look at these rocks. And one of the things I want to talk about with you is that when you squash, in this case we're squashing from the right and from the left, when we do that, we deform the rocks, and with time what we do is we start to have this feature here, the axial plane that I talked about, the thing that defines the axis of these folds. 
that axial plane gets foliation. And foliation is a word for realignment of minerals along that plane of weakness. Because it's being squashed from the left and the right, there is a plane of low stress where minerals regrow. So it's very much as if you had smashed this from both sides. Things, and you can see that subtly here, but you can see it even better here. So here's a beautiful anticline coming up and over and around. And notice how the clay minerals in this are all starting to align with the cleavage. So we call that either cleavage or foliation. Just to confuse you, we have two words for it. But it's either called foliation or cleavage, and it's called axial planar foliation. This is really neat because this tells us what the regional stresses are doing. It tells us how this whole block of rock behaved. I think I had one more of an excellent example of here's the beautiful axial planar foliation and this is a anticline, syncline over here and you can see how all the bedding is conforming beautifully. And there's one that's multiply folded, kind of like the zebra rocks on Kangaroo Island. So it can be deformed in such a weird way that it'll have many different patterns of folding. But nonetheless, the axial planes of all of these folds are like this and there's some axial planar foliation there. So, I'm going to end with that, but I just wanted you to take out of this the fact that we can, we can understand how rocks were deformed simply by looking at the folding and the foliation. And that I want you to take home from this, and I'll ask you some questions about this afterwards, that axial planar foliation lines along the axial plane, which is the point at which the fold changes direction. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you.